again, I'm John Tracy and I am the wildlife veterinarian for um, uh, the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources and I'm relatively new uh, moving down here in late late uh, December of last year. And so, um, although I'm learning the state of Virginia, I still am told I have my long old Midwestern accent. So, uh, it probably isn't going to go away in the next hour, but uh, um, you'll, you'll get used to it, I promise. <laughs> um, so, uh, I'm going to go first and I'm going to tell you a little bit just about uh, avian influenza viruses in general, influenza viruses overall, and then just a little bit about what we're seeing with this current high path AI uh, outbreak that's that's uh, been in well, over a year now of in wild birds and, and domestic birds uh, in the U.S. So, um, all right, let's uh, let's get started then. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so just uh, avian influenza virus. Uh, what is this thing, right? Um, and a real quick background on influenza viruses. Um, so, all influenza viruses belong in this uh, orthomyxoviridae family. So these orthomyxoviruses, um, they are uh, negative sense RNA viruses. There are three major sort of types. So type A, type B, and, and type C, and that's based on some nucleocapsid uh, differences, but, but all avian influenza viruses are, are type A viruses. Um, <clears throat> so these viruses are, uh, pretty hardy in the environment. They can survive over a month uh, in in fomites, uh, you know, a variety of fomites, manure, soil, water. Um, they can survive real long in cold weather. And it's pretty common for us to associate influenza viruses with cooler weather, like in, you know, when we see our seasonal influenza outbreaks, it, it tends to be in the fall, winter, uh, spring rather than, than in the summer. Um, so these viruses, they can be found in all birds, uh, but most commonly waterfowl and, and some poultry species. And then influenza viruses are subtyped uh, based on a combination of two, two proteins, so hemagglutinin and, and neuramidase. And these are, uh, on the surface or envelope of the virus. And we have another slide coming up next about this, but, uh, uh, and then avian influenza viruses are labeled either highly pathogenic or lowly pathogenic. So high path AI or low path AI. And it really has to do with the uh, pathogenicity that we see in in uh, chickens and, and poultry, but, uh, some of the pathogenicity is also determined by some of our modern DNA sequencing techniques as well. So, um, next slide, please. All right. So, so here's a generic influenza virus, and um, as you can see, like as the the capsid is cut away there, and so we, you know, the the RNA is enclosed in inside the virus and then this envelope contains these spike proteins that, uh, so hemagglutinin and neuramidase. And so neuramidase is the, uh, or sorry, hemagglutinin is really responsible for the cell binding and then neuramidase is responsible for release uh, of the cell into the, into the, or release of the RNA into the host cell. Um, what's real interesting with influenza viruses is that we get these unique combinations. So there are at that we know of 16 different subtypes of hemagglutinin. We've just labeled them one to 16. So H1, H2, H3. There are nine different subtypes of neuramidase, H1, H2, et cetera. And if we combine these in different ways, that means we can come up with 144 different possible combinations of uh, H's and N's. Now, that's just one part of the story uh, because... Uh, oh, there's one available, those we'll you can check. Um, if, 
if two different influenza viruses infect a, like the same cell, then genes can reassort and the progeny viruses can be different. So you could have, you know, an H5 and one virus and an H3 and two virus, and then you could end up with an H5 and two virus. Okay, so um, so that's really important. And those those really big changes or gene reassortments, that's called antigenic shift. And that's really the mechanism by which we get these sort of novel viruses that cause uh, that that cause pandemics. And, and so uh, influenza viruses, you know, today we're specifically talking about avian influenza, but, but influenza viruses in general, different types commonly infect humans. We know that pigs, horses, birds, dogs. Um, and, and when we get reassortment of these viruses, then we can have novel, um, you know, totally novel viruses emerge that that we have no immunity to, and they they can, in, at certain times, become highly zoonotic, meaning they infect people, right? And so there are classical examples of this, um, like this 1918 Spanish influenza uh, was an H1N virus. Uh, we think that a lot of those. Uh, Viral origins were in birds, but we don't have a, a ton of detail going back that far. You know, and that particular virus is thought to have been one of the worst uh, pandemics in the world, killing roughly 50 million people. Um, in 2009, we all lived through this this swine flu epidemic in in 2009 that originated in California and then quickly moved across the United States and world in the world uh, was also an H1N1 virus. Um, in 2015 and then into 2016, sorry, other way back up a year, in 2014 and then into 2015, um, we had uh, a significant highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreak in the United States, which was an H5N2 and an H5N8 virus. Um, and now, in 2022 and 2023, we've got another significant outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza, uh, really worldwide, but in the in the United States, uh, starting in the spring, winter of 2022, and then continuing through today. And this is an H5N1 virus. Um, next slide, please. So uh, we don't have to read all of this, but basically, um, you know, so low path and high path AI. Um, most of this has to do with just the severity with which the virus causes disease in poultry and, and, and in chickens, um, also in wild birds, but um, more characterized by what the viruses do in, in uh, uh, poultry. Uh, so most the, the avian influenza viruses that we're really concerned with are H5 and H7 viruses. Um, and H5 and H7 low path avian influenza viruses have the ability to mutate uh, or to reassort into H5 or H7 high path viruses. And so uh, we do a lot of surveillance for these viruses to, to pick them up um, early in the course of outbreaks. Um, next slide, please. All right, so, so how does avian influenza spread? Well, um, as we said in an earlier slide, the virus is really hardy on fomites, okay? And so um, it can be spread through uh, you know, from farm to farm um, <clears throat> with boots, fecal contamination. It can be spread through water. It can be spread through from direct contact from bird to bird. It can be spread in some cases by aerosolization and even windblown. Um, and, and so they're pretty hardy and they're pretty infectious. 
but waterfowl in particular are the main reservoir for these viruses. And, and so waterfowl have evolved that in most cases they are asymptomatic, meaning um, showing no symptoms. Uh, and and can you know can carry the virus and 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 move it all over the world and and so for high path and low path AI in general just for AI or or for avian influenza think of waterfall as the main reservoir where the virus hangs out sort of long term. Um, next slide and. This is uh, a little bit unfortunate for uh, for us as we try to manage the disease because we know that waterfowl uh, go all over the place, right? And and so with, these are migratory birds um, that often stick within specific flyways, but can at times um, end up in different flyways or co-mingle in breeding grounds. Um, as they go uh, uh, north and south. Next slide, please. Uh, I just wanted to show some slides uh, that I thought would would be helpful for us to see how far these birds actually go. And so these are a couple of projects that our waterfowl biologists in Virginia are involved with. Um, and Basically, what you have here is a map um, and, and you can see this this purple dot up by the Hudson Bay and then and then on the other side, uh, there's sort of 2, 2 source points there. These are Canada geese that were banded. Up there in uh, in Canada, so in the northern part of Canada and and then they were outfitted with little GPS trackers that ping cell phone towers. And so you can see uh, basically. Every time that there is a a uh, yellow or sorry an orange or a purple dot, that's when the the bird pinged a cell phone tower and information was downloaded. And so they go these long distances, sort of from north to south, uh, without pinging any cell phone towers because there aren't any up there. And then as they get down into southern southern Canada, we start to pick them up, and and you can see where they end up. And so this is uh, uh, <clears throat> this is migration in the fall uh, after the birds spend the summer up up in Canada. Next slide, please. And then similarly, here's a project uh, that our uh, waterfowl biologists are involved with. These are black ducks that were outfitted with GPS collars. They're, they're not really collars, they're more harnesses. Uh, the little GPS box lives on the back of the bird and is held on by a, a little sort of backpack harness. And uh, so these were all placed in Virginia over on the Eastern shore. And then uh, each color here is a separate bird and you can see where these birds ended up as they went north in the spring. So, uh, you know, these, uh, so waterfowl are the reservoir for these viruses and, and you can see, right, they are moving these viruses all over the landscape. All right. So, uh, just a little bit of a timeline for what we've been uh, dealing with over the last, uh, let's say 15 to 16 months. Um, so, in the United States, uh, we do active surveillance. This is done by the USDA and and basically the USDA has a, a surveillance model set up where they sample a specific number of waterfowl from each flyway in, in each state and they, they sample them using a matrix test that looks for a number of, of different types of avian influenza viruses. And uh, we knew that there was this particular virus that was over in Europe at the time, and so we were aware of it. But on January 12th, uh, we found the first uh, 
the first time we found this particular clade of H5N1 virus in the United States, and it was during this surveillance that USDA did on a hunter harvested duck in North Carolina. And then a couple of weeks later, we got uh, some positives from some hunter harvested ducks in Virginia. And so really the initial nidus of virus when we found it was in North Carolina and Virginia. It's likely that virus came down the Eastern seaboard. Um, and so had its origin sort of in Northern Europe and then and then crossed the Atlantic over into Canada and then came down the, the Eastern seaboard and we found it first in, in North Carolina and Virginia. Um, so we sort of, uh, as a nation, then we went on high alert and it was only a couple of weeks later, uh, we, we got our first uh, detection in poultry, and this was in a commercial turkey farm in Indiana. And so we sort of already went from the eastern seaboard to the Midwest. Um, a few days later, uh, we got actual wild bird mortalities. And so those first, those ducks, those are sort of opportunistic sample collections from hunter killed birds that, that are for all intents and purposes normal or asymptomatic. But then uh, we had some snow geese. Uh, in North Carolina die off in fairly large numbers. And then we had this sort of repeat itself in, in multiple, multiple areas along the Eastern seaboard. Um, this particular virus has been shown to uh, hit scavengers pretty hard and uh, predators pretty hard. And so we noticed the first Raptor mortality in February, just a few days later. This was in a hawk from Delaware. Um, and then in Florida, uh, uh, they identified the virus in a dead black vulture. Um, <clears throat> so black vultures then sort of continued to die across the Eastern seaboard. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about them in a, in a second. Um, End of, sorry, I'm just reading the chat quick. Okay. Um, end of March, uh, there was a bottlenose dolphin reported uh, dead in Florida from highly pathogenic avian influenza. And so that was the first mammal that we had detected in the United States. Um, and then just bringing it a little bit closer to Virginia here. Uh, so April uh, 29th, this is of 2022, we had a, a bald eagle die. In George County, that was diagnosed uh, with highly pathogenic avian influenza. We've had a handful of eagles that we know of uh, that we've submitted since, since then, uh, all uh, confirmed with HBAI. And then, really, in it wasn't until July that we started seeing vultures, uh, black vultures in Virginia, get hit pretty hard. But uh, when the vultures in Virginia got hit, they got hit real hard. Uh, so next slide. Um, so black vultures, uh, I just wanna to touch on this a little bit because if you've been affected by highly pathogenic avian influenza, it's likely that you may have seen vulture mortalities, but we've had 30 some, just looking here. So 39 different mortality events of vultures reported just from July until now. And in some of these cases, we're talking hundreds of birds. So um, there's been a very significant mortality event in, in vultures, uh, in particularly in black vultures. So we don't see it readily in turkey vultures. It's been reported in them, but but not nearly to the same extent that we see it in black vultures. And so uh, some of this has to do with the fact that they're scavenging and you know likely coming into the virus that way, but then they roost in these huge numbers. And uh, when the virus is, is uh, brought into a, a roost, uh, we can see significant, if not all, uh, mortality in that particular roost. And so, there have been over the last years uh, or over the last year since from July to now really thousands of vulture carcasses laying on across the landscape in Virginia and and the whole eastern seaboard in general. Um, 
Next slide. All right, so uh, the United States Department of Agriculture, uh, USDA, they keep an official track of all of the reported cases of avian influenza in the United States. And so these are laboratory confirmed cases. So basically if we test a bird, uh, we can test it at a reference laboratory, but then all tests are getting confirmed at the National Veterinary Services Laboratory in Ames, Iowa. And so in all of these cases, uh, these are these are confirmed tests by NVSL. And so, uh, you know, Virginia, we're over there, 35 confirmed cases, North Carolina, 204. A, a lot of that probably has to do with what we're testing. Uh, it was decided last, uh, last fall, really, that, you know, if we came across a, a bunch of Dead vultures that we knew that was likely high path AI, and, and we didn't invest a lot of uh, energy into into testing those birds. But um, what's more important here is that you can see that this particular virus is widespread, and so all states uh, have now been affected. Um, and you know, although it was first isolated over here on the Atlantic seaboard, um, it's affected everyone in um, in the United States and really all of North America. All right, and then just one other interesting note about this avian influenza virus was that um, it has shown some affinity for mammals. And so this dolphin, this was kind of an kind of a unique experience that was that was one individual uh, that was uh, uh, found dead in Florida and then and then tested positive, but starting in the Midwest in April, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, uh, we had numerous reports of red foxes uh, that were testing positive for for high path uh, skunks and uh, some bobcats in in Wisconsin, and so <clears throat> these animals are likely uh, scavenging dead birds and then and then becoming infected that way. Um, and so once we've, a, as a sort of wildlife community, have been, uh, have started to recognize that, that mammals are affected, uh, we've been looking a little bit harder in, um, and been finding it in, in various species. Um, there's a question in, in the chat about how was the dolphin exposed? And uh, mm -hmm. honestly, I'm not I'm not totally sure. I don't have a great answer for you. It's it's kind of a a, a theory that uh, probably waterborne uh, through, you know, contaminated water uh, with with uh, avian. Uh, excrement or um, or or other infected animals just utilizing similar similar water areas, and so there are there have been some similar things. So this was just the one dolphin in in Florida, but there have been a, a few unique outbreaks. Uh, one involving harbor seals in Maine, uh, where we had a significant die off of harbor seals uh, in the hundreds. Um, one with uh, Peruvian sea lions uh, uh, down in South America, again, hundreds of specimens. And, uh, and then in Europe, they had, uh, I think this was in Spain, uh, a significant outbreak at, in a domestic mink farm. And so they're you know, although most of the time we're seeing sort of scattered reports in mammals here and there, there have been in a few cases some um, significant outbreaks where there's clearly mammal to mammal tra transmission as well. Uh, next slide. All right, so here's USDA's map on uh, mammal detections that have at least been confirmed with highly pathogenic avian influenza in the United States. And you, so you can see that Virginia, um, we're not in on the game yet. It's likely we have had mammals die in Virginia. We just haven't found them um, uh, or haven't been able to isolate virus from particular carcasses. But really, 
the only thing close to us, there was a uh, one black bear uh, down in North Carolina that was confirmed uh, uh, dead from highly pathogenic avian influenza. There's been a handful of grizzly bears out west. There's been some big cats and some uh, in some smaller zoos that are probably feeding uh, uh, contaminated sort of avian carcasses to individuals. And then you can see um, some of these other species. So a lot of it is uh, sort of carnivores or scavengers, but then we had that sort of unique situation with, with some of the marine mammals um, that um, is probably waterborne. And then in some cases, like the harbor seals, um, probably some mammal to mammal transmission taking place. Um, all right, next slide. So, what are we at the Department of Wildlife Resources doing about this virus? And so, uh, our response has evolved over time. Um, initially, we were on high alert and we were responding to basically every uh, call about dead birds that we received. Um, this is prior to me being in Virginia, and so I don't have a ton of history or personal uh, history with that response, but um, once it, once we found out the virus was sort of widespread in a lot of bird species, we have now, um, although we will still respond to all reports of sick and dead birds, we may or may not test them all. And so um, basically the laboratories got overwhelmed in a hurry with all the samples coming in. And so we were asked uh, by one of our reference laboratories to really prioritize our testing um, and focus on species that the virus has not been diagnosed in, um, areas the virus has not been diagnosed, large mortality events, uh, you know, in, involving uh, one or more species and then high priority species. And so we are testing, let's say, uh, certain raptors, like we'll test eagles or a peregrine falcon, even if it's, you know, one or two carcasses, but um, we consider those to be sort of high priority species. And so we get, uh, you know, DWR gets information from the public in a variety of ways. Uh, we do have a wildlife conflict helpline that um, is in collaboration with USDA and we receive a lot of information from there, um, sometimes from straight from our customer services agencies or our customer service uh, operations, uh, sometimes from other agencies that are in the field and you know, sometimes just from our staff being in the field uh, and interacting with, with the public. Um, we do maintain a database of all of the die-offs or reported events, um, and so we've got that. In, and this is whether or not we confirm high path AI in them, but if we suspect it, um, it will go into the database. Um, and then we have uh, regular meetings with our partners. Uh, you know, this virus is not isolated to one specific area. Uh, it's widespread. It's affecting a number of species. It's affecting agriculture. It has public health implications. And so, uh, you know, we collaborate, we coordinate, we share data uh, with all of our partner agencies. And then, you know, sort of long term, we'll be involved with evaluating population level impacts of the virus. Uh, so, I, you know, I mentioned that in Virginia, we've had significant vulture mortality events. Uh, some of the eastern states have had really significant uh, die-offs of seabirds like gannets. Um, and so, uh, you know, we will be involved with uh, population monitoring uh, for, for all of those species going forward. Um, next slide. All right, so this is actually my... Uh, Final slide, uh, and basically, uh, I said that we get a lot of uh, uh, information from the Virginia Wildlife Conflict Helpline, um, and so this is a, a service that we run in coordination with 
with USDA. And so it's actually staffed by USDA uh, uh, members, but they'll take the initial phone calls and sort of triage phone calls and then report them to appropriate people in DWR so that we can respond. And so I just wanted to provide this number for you uh, so that uh, if you were to uh, witness, uh, you know, high numbers or uh, uh, a, a group of dead birds or mammals, really, that um, this is how you would get a hold of us to, to tell us about it. Um, and I think before I pass it off, I'm going to try to answer just a couple of questions in the chat. So, uh, waterborne transmission to a mammal uh, is concerning, certainly is. Um, and I think, um, you know, that is speculative on how that transmission occurred, but uh, that sort of theoretical model is that, you know, for for like these sea lions or or seals that the initial event is maybe waterborne, but maybe you know shoreline. So so these birds can can congregate in huge numbers on. Uh, on shoreline and on islands and, and, you know, leave a significant amount of excrement and virus on the landscape. And so that, that is probably the way that these viruses are finding their way into, into mammals. But um, some of that is still speculative. We don't really have definitive evidence of that. Um, <clears throat> how widespread is this strain overseas? And uh, so, uh, it's pretty widespread. Uh, I might refer a little bit to carry about some of the uh, domestic impacts, but uh, Europe had been dealing with this for uh, a period of time before we found it in the U.S. and and so it's um, it's pretty widespread at this point. Um, the Virus, uh, the initial H5N1 virus probably originated in China years ago, but uh, has undergone some reassortment events. Um, and I think maybe in 2020, uh, acquired an N1 uh, that had wild bird origins and then, um, you know, has evolved several times in Europe since then. And so um, there's, uh, Anyway, at this point, it's it, it is widespread. Um, were there? Let's see. Is there any evidence for asymptomatic carriage? Uh, certainly in waterfowl, yes, um, and uh, uh, not. Uh, we have not seen any evidence for asymptomatic carriage in mammals yet, uh, uh, but definitely in waterfowl. Uh, were there mammals affected in the two thousand? to avian influenza outbreak in Virginia? I guess I'm not sure. I was not around in Virginia at that point, but um, not that I'm aware of. I, I can check into that. Uh, and then finally, are there any projects trying to find a vaccine or something to curb it? Um, yeah, there is some vaccine research. I'm gonna let Carrie, maybe do you wanna talk a little bit more about that, but uh, it would be, it would be extremely difficult. Even if we had an effective vaccine, it would be extremely difficult to vaccinate uh, migratory birds at a landscape level. Um, and so, uh, um, yeah, uh, the you know, in terms of avian influenza viruses and curbing it, it was hoped that uh, like in 2015, as the birds migrated north, then uh, it, the 2015 virus just sort of went away. But in this 2022 outbreak, uh, that has not happened. Uh, so we actually had sort of a surge of virus in June, and then the virus moved uh, westward and we had some Midwestern cases. And, and so it, you know, although we got sort of a lull in the summer of 22, then we had another huge spike in the fall. And, and so this virus has not acted 
in a similar way to how that 2015 virus interacted. And as honestly, it's probably here, it's gonna be here for a while uh, because it's widespread on the landscape at this point. Um, let's see, black vultures. Do you have any data on population numbers, 2022 pre-hypathic AI and, and post-hypath AI? A little. Um, or we have people. Uh, we we do have some modeling that was done, and I don't have the paper in front of me, but there was a group that did some modeling on what our population of black vultures could sustain um, as uh, in terms of how many birds could we remove from the black vulture population before we'd be concerned about you know the the survival or the health of that species and and I know that it's not believed that we have hit that number yet. Um, there is a group in Florida right now that is trying to gather data, all of the black vulture data from all of the states in the uh, in the southeast, and and to try to do some more widespread widespread landscape modeling on that species. And so I think we will have that information, but we're we're just starting to put it together. Um, Yeah, poultry impacts. I'll let Carrie handle that one. Uh, any comments on report of first human case? Uh, I'm going to let Julia handle the public health uh, and human case uh, data. And so that will be coming up in just a little bit. Um, was the wide scale songbird die off ever attributed to this virus or identified as any other? And no, it was not. So the the widespread songbird die-off that took place um, has, uh, we, we still do not have a definitive cause of that. And it is um, not this virus. And if, if it were, uh, we would know that. So there was significant influenza virus testing done on, on those, those birds. Um, what are the symptoms of an inf infected mammal? Um, so influenza viruses, uh, characteristically often cause respiratory symptoms, but um, can also be prone to causing neurologic symptoms. And so uh, with mammals, uh, we might see mammals sort of wandering uh, aimlessly. Uh, we might see, you know, crusty scaled eye, eyelids or difficulty breathing from the respiratory symptoms um, and, and so it seems like the respiratory system and the neurologic system and brain are the most affected systems. Um, and then is there, there might be a hand up yet. Did I get all the questions or? And we can, we can hold them too till the end um, and swoop back in and pick them up <clears throat> if we missed anything. Okay, yeah, certainly. And if, if I need to expand on any of the questions, I'm happy to do that at the end. So thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate uh, appreciate the time being here. And uh, I'll hang on until the end if there are any questions. All right. Good evening, everybody. Can somebody give me a thumbs up that you can hear me okay? Yes, we got you. All right, perfect. Uh, well, as Kate mentioned in the beginning, um, thank you for the thumbs up. Um, I mentioned, I, I'm Dr. Carolyn Bissett with the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Uh, I've been there for about 10 years now. And for the last, since 2016, I've managed the Office of Veterinary Services. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And so I'm going to talk about the impacts on um, our poultry industry. So, Dr. Tracy covered this uh, in his in his presentation, um, low path and high path. I think we've got a good feel on that. So, I will say that in somebody mentioned the 2002 outbreak here in Virginia, that was a low path virus um, that caused tremendous economic impacts on the poultry industry in Virginia. We also had a 2007 low path outbreak in Virginia that was a little less significant than 2002, 
but to my knowledge, I wasn't around in 2002 for that outbreak, but, um, so I, I, I but I, I, I can answer the question about the, the mammals. There, there was no impact that we saw, or at least that was reported uh, in mammalian species during that outbreak. Moving on to the next slide. Um, I will say that, that whether it's low path AI or high path AI, avian influenza and domestic species in Virginia is what we call a reportable disease. Um, it, it is reportable to the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, and that's because it, it is such an important disease of, of poultry species. As Dr. Tracy mentioned, with low path, we typically see uh, low mortality or questionable mortality, um, sometimes morbidity, sometimes not. We can see respiratory signs. A lot of times, the only thing we'll see is a production drop. So maybe an egg production drop or water uh, consumption drop, something like that. Versus highly pathogenic avian influenza in domestic poultry species, we tend to see high morbidity and mortality up to 100% possible. Um, what we typically see are external hemorrhage or cyanosis, that, that wonderful blue gray color, um, respiratory signs, and again, production drops oftentimes are the first things that we'll see. And of course, we've got some obligatory um, pictures there where you can see the, the hemorrhage in the far right in the respiratory tract, some cyanosis around joints, and then the combs and waddles of birds. And oftentimes we'll see swollen eyes and respiratory symptoms. So moving on to the next slide, why do we care? Um, so Dr. Tracy, provided a good overview of why we care about waterfowl, um, but why do we care about avian influenza um, here so much in the United States? And that's really threefold. And one, because as we've seen in other countries, some of these avian influenza viruses can be zoonotic or they can transmit to people. I'll point out, and Dr. Murphy will um, emphasize this as well, that we have not seen that with this current high path AI event uh, here in the United States. Um, and I won't delve any further into that. Dr. Murphy will cover that, but um, it does not se seem to be uh, zoonotic or have those tendencies at that at this point. Of course, there's, there's always a chance as Dr. Tracy mentioned for reassortment. And so we're, we're constantly kind of monitoring that, uh, but Dr. Murphy will talk more about the zoonosis possibilities. So that's certainly one reason we care. Um, another reason we care is because, as Dr. Tracy mentioned, waterfowl are the reservoir and oftentimes asymptomatic carriers, but our domestic birds, particularly poultry, chickens, turkeys, ducks, and geese, um, are often very sick or experience death because of avian influenza. Um, and then because of that, we see serious economic impacts on the poultry industry. So we can see obviously sick and dead birds, and then we see trade bans. Um, and we'll talk about the importance of that on the, on the next slide. So we'll move there. And this is why we care here in the Commonwealth. Um, agriculture is our number one economic industry in Virginia. And of that poultry is the number one agricultural uh, commodity. So you'll see there, we've got three different types of poultry production here in Virginia, broilers, these are your meat chickens. Uh, that's our number one economic industry here in Virginia. Um, and we're actually ranked either, sometimes it's ninth, sometimes it's 10th in the United States for broiler production. Turkeys are number four for our uh, economic industry here in Virginia. And we're typically ranked around sixth or so in the country in Turkey production. And then eggs sitting down there at number 11. Um, not a huge uh, impact here, but it, it's still, uh, you know, $89 million is still a lot of money for egg production here in Virginia. We're not a large layer state, but it's certainly an important economic industry. So that's why we care. You can see there that uh, poultry accounts for typically $1.3 billion per year um, in economics here in Virginia. We've got a lot of, of family farms 
particularly in the Shenandoah Valley, which is one of the top poultry producing regions in the United States, and also over on the Eastern Shore. Somebody in the chat mentioned the Eastern Shore, um, and we, uh, we've got a lot of, of broiler production over there on the Eastern Shore associated with the Maryland and, and Delaware industries. So next slide. So we'll talk about our Virginia cases, moving on to the next slide and, and what we've seen here uh, since 2022. Um, Dr. Tracy had the timeline there where we saw some, some wildlife detections in early 2022 and then the first domestic poultry detection was in Indiana, but very quickly, I believe we were the second or third state uh, not a great distinction to have in the U.S. in February of 2022 when we saw a detection in what we termed a backyard flock. So typically we divide up poultry into either poultry or commercial poultry, uh, which was what we've I've been talking about in the last slide, and our backyard flock or what we call our, you know, our hobbyists, those people that may have six chickens, up to, you know, 150 birds. Uh oh, I lost the slides. Did everybody lose the slides? Oh. Hang on, somebody opened the whiteboard for me. Okay. Get you back on track here. <laughs> All right, no problem. But just to, to kind of keep talking while uh, we're working on that. So our, our backyard birds will typically see you know, just as many people or some people on this call may have a few chickens for eggs or um, pet species, <coughs> excuse me, um, versus some people may have, and we've seen upwards of a couple of hundred. As long as you're not selling poultry products, then you are considered to be a backyard producer or a backyard farmer versus those that, um, that sell commercially. And so you'll see on this slide here, we have had so far since February of 2022, 10 detections of this highly pathogenic H5N1 um, in domestic poultry here in Virginia. Um, you'll see the six circles there in Fauquier, Caroline, and then over in the Virginia Beach, Hampton Roads section it's hard to see, but there's a tiny green star up in Alexandria. And then two red stars surrounded by a green zone and then another yellow star in Rockingham County. So that's um, a total of 10 detections that we've seen here again since February of 2022. Moving on to the next slide. So most of those have been backyard detections, and I just sort of explained the, the difference there between backyard and commercial. Our first one was in Fauquier and involved chickens and ducks. Um, and then Caroline County uh, was a rather large, about 150 birds that um, an individual had in their backyards and that include chickens, ducks, geese, and some, some peacocks, or what we call peafowl. And then in Hampton in October, we had a little bit of a break from February to August. Um, and while we typically think of avian influenza as being more of a winter type disease, given its propensity to, to do well in cold weather, um, we started to see, uh, and across the nation, we started to see an uptick in cases uh, during the summer. Um, and so we saw that that uh, that detection in August, and then in in October we had a, a small zoo in Hampton, where three emus died um, of hapath avian influenza, and then Virginia Beach, Southampton, Gloucester, um, in last fall, and then lastly Rockingham here in March of 2023. Um, those were all backyard detections. We also had a detection in what we call a live bird market, and that was in Alexandria, and it was in the, the city of Alexandria, not in Fairfax County. Um, but a live bird market is, is an interesting thing. It's um, highly regulated, 
Uh, we do inspections regularly. They do sell downs and cleaning and disinfection. But it is what exactly what the name implies, which is you as an individual citizen can go in, pick out the bird that you want to take home for consumption, and they will slaughter it on site. So it's very fresh. <laughs> Excuse me, I have this little tickle in my throat. I apologize. Um, and so you, you pick out your bird. Uh, you take it, they slaughter it there at the facility. You take the carcass home for consumption. Um, and that's very popular in certain ethnic um, circles. And so we've got actually three live bird markets here in Virginia. Uh, that's not a whole lot. We, um, we, there are other states that have, you know, many more live bird markets, depending on their population. Uh, but the 1 in Alexandria um, is it's. Extremely clean stainless steel construction again, part of part of what they do for disease management. Um, and and is a quarterly sell down where they sell down all the birds. They have complete cleaning and disinfection. And then we come in quarterly. My staff goes in does an inspection does environmental sampling for avian influenza. Um, and then they're allowed to. Open back up again. It, it is somewhat similar to what you think about and what you've seen probably in the news or various news outlets or magazines on live markets in other parts of the world. But this is very highly regulated here in the United States. Um, and we typically don't see a lot of disease events associated with that. This particular live bird market uh, got some ducks that came from a farm in another state that had tested positive for AI. Uh, the day after those ducks had shipped, and so we went in and tested them, and they also tested positive for AI. So we uh, managed that situation like we do with all commercial and backyard detections, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, so moving on to the next slide, our first case, and and before I get into our first case, I, I neglected to mention just sort of the sort of national picture with domestic species. Um, there are did there have been detections of AI and domestic birds in 47 states. So far only Hawaii, Louisiana, Puerto Rico, and strangely West Virginia uh, have escaped without an HPAI detection. So this is as widespread as you can get for an animal disease. Uh, event here in the United States, and all of that has been since February of last year. So our first case was February 11th. Um, basically, the the owner noticed that she lost one turkey on a Tuesday, kept losing birds throughout the week, and then by Friday had lost seven in one day. By Friday evening, she'd lost half of her chickens, a bunch of turkeys. And she called us at VDAX and we said, yeah, we need to test your birds. This, this sounds really suspicious. And we got what's called an AI matrix, which is a, a test for a avian influenza, influenza A virus. And if we get a positive or what we term a non-negative on that, then we'll run H5 and H7. And we got an H5 uh, positive result uh, that day on Friday. Whenever we do testing here in Virginia, our Harrisonburg lab is um, validated to run avian influenza samples, but they all have to be confirmed by the National Reference Laboratory at NBSL, and that's in Ames, Iowa, and that was confirmed on Saturday. And so typically, unfortunately, what we have to do with these flocks, whether they be backyard, commercial, et cetera, is to depopulate the flock, and that's twofold reasons. One, we want to stop the virus from spreading. And when these birds become sick, they they produce a lot of virus. We call them little virus factories. Um, they just produce a, a tremendous amount of virus in the environment. And as Dr. Tracy um, elucidated quite well, we know how infectious avian influenza is. The other reason that we depopulate these animals is an animal welfare uh, reason. These birds get really sick. Domestic birds get very, very sick from AI. 
from high path AI. As I mentioned earlier, we tend to see 100% mortality. Um, these birds are just really sick and, and there's no treatment for it. So, um, moving on to the next slide. Here's uh, just some pictures from our Fauquier County um, first detection. There was a pond on the property and she let her ducks and geese and chickens and, and turkeys sort of wander. And it's hard to tell, but all that's that picture on the left, if you look on the, the other side, the far side of the pond, all of those black dots are Canadian geese, wild Canadian geese that congregated on her property, commingled with her animals. Um, and so it was just a perfect recipe for her uh, birds to commingle with wild waterfowl, um, picked up the virus from them and then just spread it amongst her flock. Next picture, our next slide. None of these birds are deceased. These are the birds as we found them. You can just see they're sick birds. They don't want to move. Um, you can't move them. You just got to pick them up. Uh, you can see that bird on the far right just has respiratory secretions stemming from its beak and, and mouth. And so these are just really, really sick, sick birds. And so from a welfare standpoint, the best thing we can do is to go ahead and end their suffering. Next slide. Again, same thing. Uh, you can see some of that cyanosis there in the combs and wattle uh, of the bird in the middle. And again, these are not birds after depopulation. These are birds as we found them live and, and just sick as could be. Um, next slide. So our commercial detections, um, we detected uh, in Rockingham County, which is really the sort of the seat of our um, poultry production here in Virginia, it's the most concentrated, as I mentioned earlier, one of the most concentrated um, in, in the United States. And so our first uh, detection was in, was in early January, I believe it was January 18th. And then six days later, we had a second detection. Both were in commercial turkeys and about 102 to 112 day old turkeys, which for your reference is about a week or so away from um, slaughter for, uh, for, for uh, yeah, for, from slaughter production. So these are really old birds. They sit about three and a half, four feet tall. They're big birds, um, but unfortunately they were very, very sick birds uh, approximately between the two farms, 36,000. Uh, tom turkeys, which are male turkeys, which are a little bit bigger. They probably each bird was about 40 to 45 pounds. And I'll talk about in, in a slide or two uh, what we do when we have these detections, but we've got a good picture of it here on the on the left side of your screen. The farm is in the red center of that red circle. And what we do is we quarantine the farm, what we call the index farm, which is the positive farm. And then we create two circles, two radius around each farm. And we call that the control area. So the red circle is the infected zone and the green circle is the buffer air, buffer zone. And between that, we, we call that whole area the control area. And so I'll talk about that in a little bit, but it's that's a 6.2 mile or 10 kilometer control area around the index or positive farm. Uh, moving on to the next slide. So here we go, how do we respond? So as I just mentioned, we quarantine the positive farm, which means that we're restricting movement of all poultry and poultry products, poultry equipment, um, anything on that farm has to be quarantined in place and they have to get permission to move anything agricultural related off of that farm. We eradicate the disease. So again, talking about humanely euthanizing 
or depopulating those birds. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. We do monitoring. And so that control area that we set up, the 10 kilometer control area, we do enhanced surveillance or basically testing. Um, all poultry producing commercial production within that control area goes under an enhanced surveillance plan. And so they test their birds depending on the age of the birds um, is usually within 72 hours of the detection and then weekly after that for a time just to make sure that we're catching any evidence of lateral spread or spread from farm to farm. We know that from this incident here in 2022, 2023, um, that we're seeing 85% of the cases we're seeing nationally are from point source introductions, which uh, basically means they're they're coming from exposure to droppings from wild waterfowl. Uh, but we are seeing 15% of lateral spread or spread from farm to farm. And what's probably happening there is either a truck or conveyance or a farm worker, um, a service technician that goes from farm to farm may accidentally spread that virus from farm to farm. By and large, we're seeing that um, introduction from wild waterfowl, but we're still seeing enough farm to farm spread that we wanna make sure that if that's happening, we catch it early. Then we disinfect. So the um, infected premises go through a disinfection period. And so what we do here in Virginia is once the birds are depopulated, they are composted in the barn. And so we've got national experts that come in. They uh, do, they've got a lot of complex algorithms and formulas that they work to figure out exactly how much carbon material, typically that's wood shavings or mulch is combined with the carcasses. And that compost is set up in windrows or, or sort of, um, piles in the center of the barn and it's just like any other compost it creates heat when you the the bioactivity of the bacteria and such with the carbon material and the organic matter create heat that actually we've shown in in various studies actually kills the virus so and it breaks down the carcasses and so it, it kind of twofold there um and that compost sits in the barns for at least 28 days, uh, which you'd be surprised at the end of the 28 days, there's very little left of the carcasses, occasionally a small bone here or there, but those carcasses have broken down completely. The virus is gone. But we monitor those compost piles with temperature taking to make sure that they reach a certain temperature for a certain period of time to make sure that um, the, the virus has been inactivated. And then that compost is moved outside. Eventually that compost will become compost on farms for crops. Um, it's high in nitrogen and other organic matter and makes a great compost material. So it's recycled. Um, and then once the compost is moved outside of the barns, the barns are cleaned completely. Gets down to, to, com to the concrete floor and the wood beams and then disinfectant is applied to all the surfaces. That's allowed to sit on contact for uh, at least a couple of days until it dries. And then we test, number five there, we do environmental sampling to make sure that the poultry farm and the barns are free of avian influenza virus. As you can imagine, that takes time, and so um, usually it's a it's a couple of months that that poultry farm is down and out of commission for all of this to happen. Um, but it's important for trade purposes that that whole process is is followed uh, to the T, and so our trading partners expect that um, they they want to see all of the documentation that all of those steps are followed. Uh, and eventually we'll get back to normal trading status. Um, next slide. So depopulation, somebody asked about that. Um, 
you know, when you're talking about euthanizing 1 or 2 animals here and there, um, there are specific guidelines that the American veterinary medical association sets out for individual animal euthanasia. When we're talking about a barn of 25,000 turkeys, um, the AVMA or that American veterinary medical association does have guidelines on, um. Oops, there we go. Um, does have guidelines on depopulation. And so we've got a couple of methods that we use. This slide is showing our foamers. And so basically it's a firefighter foam that we move all of the birds down to one end of the barn and uh, we apply firefighter foam up over the birds and they are deceased within a matter of a couple of minutes from airway obstruction. If we have smaller backyard uh, detector, backyard um, birds, then typically up to a couple of hundred animals, we will take containers out and carbon dioxide and use carbon dioxide uh, to euthanize those animals. And so um, it, it may not sound like the best method, but it is certainly um, more humane than dying slowly of avian influenza. Um, and so we, we take that very seriously. Um, there's constant research on better ways to depopulate large numbers of animals to reduce to disease transmission and um, maximize animal welfare. And so we, we always uh, attempt to do that in the most humane way possible. Um, so I think I've answered most of the questions there. Um, and, and I answered the composting. Uh, so I will uh, stop. I believe my, my next slide is the end slide. And so I will stop talking. If anybody, I'll hang on. So if anybody has any additional questions, but I will stop and hand it over to um, yeah, so the PPE, um, great question. I think Dr. Murphy will talk a little bit about this. Um, but all of our responders to once we get a detection of highly pathogenic avian influenza on a farm, we set up a clean, dirty line. Everything has to be disinfected on or off that farm. Everyone going on that farm has to wear at minimum Tyvek, uh, disposable boots, gloves, respiratory uh, equipment, and um, hair caps at minimum. Sometimes we may use upwards of poppers if need to. Sometimes we use Thai Kim inside the barns when we're depopulating. So minimum is, is what I described before. Ventilation shutdown is an interesting question. We have not used that so far. Um, it is one option, and, and for those of you unfamiliar, that's basically turning off all the power, adding heat to the barns um, to basically call, cause a, a, a hyper, uh, a, a elevated temperature and death through that. Um, we have not used that in Virginia. Foam is our, is our typical go-to. That's what we have experience with, but certainly ventilation shut down. Plus, we, we add plus, but um, we, uh, we have not used that here in Virginia. And then once they're depopulated, they are composted in the house. Um, we don't typically bury here in Virginia. Other states do, but we utilize composting in-house to break down those carcasses and, um, and kill, the, kill the virus. So now I'm going to shut up and turn it over to Dr. Murphy. Well, thank you, Carrie. And I, I think there's one, and and uh, I don't mean to be all up in your business, but there was one uh, question about animal control officers. And animal control officers, unless I'm missing my guess, Carrie, tell me if I'm wrong. And animal control officers are locally funded, so they are they do not receive uh, funding through the Virginia Department of Agriculture. Um, they are they are funded through local. Uh, local means, uh, county government. Uh, Carrie, I welcome your correction if there is one. You are correct. Um, they are, and every locality in Virginia is required to have at least one animal control officer. 
and they are locally employed. Um, so they are not employed or overseen by the Virginia Department of Agriculture. And then answering the questions about SBCA, certainly, I mean, anytime we have a large depopulation event with agriculture, um, you know, it is highly, highly scrutinized by a number of organizations. We all know that we've got certain organizations out there that are um, anti animal agriculture. Um, and so we, we typically see FOIA requests for all of our documents associated with these sort of, uh, responses and, and everything in between, but, um, yeah, I'll just stop there. Well, I, I appreciate this is Julie, uh, Murphy, uh, taking you, taking you home this evening, talking about the public health perspective and public health role when it comes to avian influenza. Unfortunately, we've had two great speakers. I've had two great speakers before me who have given you a great overview about the landscape of avian influenza in uh, in wildlife and in, in domestic uh, domestic poultry. And of course, as uh, John, I believe both John and Carrie mentioned, we've been sort of in response mode and, and uh, the health department no, has been in support mode, if you will, since the early part of, of last year. Now the next slide, please. Again, this is a little bit of review uh, based on John and Carrie's presentation, but there, just if we zoom out a little bit and talk about influenza in people, there are three types of influenza viruses to which people are susceptible and they fall broadly into um, uh, type A, B, and C. A is really the one we're focused on uh, this evening, but we do have other types of and categories of influenza that affect people and can make them ill, and that's B and C. I, I'm sure lots of people, or probably everybody on this this call, is familiar with those categories. But A viruses, as we know and have learned uh, throughout our time together this evening, can infect humans, birds, pigs, horses, and other wild animals. But wild birds, as John was talking about, are the natural hosts for this group of influenza viruses. Influenza B viruses generally only infect people as do type C, really only infect people and cause mild illness. But avian influenza viruses have been, as, as John was talking about, found in many bird species, but are often most found in migratory waterfowl and shorebirds. Interestingly, there is an influenza D virus. That's a more newly discovered virus to which cattle are the reservoir. It, influenza D's impact on people is still being studied but I thought it, I would include it for completeness. Now, um, as I'm sure everybody on the, on the line tonight knows that there's a, a limited number of influenza A viruses that naturally circulate in human populations. That's what we call our seasonal flu. Those are uh, usually in, influenza A viruses. Again, we do sometimes have influenza B in circulation, but B is not connected to any wildlife source. Um, uh, but but a some of our a viruses can be so we can have influenza a viruses that just naturally circulate in human populations. They're they're host adapted to people. Uh, they are not novel, if you will, in regard in in that you don't have to have contact with an animal to have any of these seasonal infections. They're naturally circulating in people. They're host adapted to people, and this is what we call our seasonal flu. We do have occasional pandemics, however, I believe John it was who, who referred to the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, which was a, an A virus that was a, um, an assortment, if you will, a reassortment actually of some amount of avian influenza, some amount of swine, and then, and then some human, uh, some influence of and, and genetic material associated with one of the viruses that, that normally circulates in people throughout our seasonal flu time. Other times we, we do, uh, there are instances of, of individual um, influenza A virus subtypes that cross the species barrier from animals to people. Now, most of the time when that happens, one, it doesn't happen very often, 
And two, when it does, typically the um, the person to person spread either ends with the person who had contact with the animal directly, or maybe very limited spread among people who either cared for that person or who are household members of that person. But one thing we're worried about in in human health, as you might imagine, is the uh, is uh, this concept of reassortment and the concern that if we have a novel influenza event, that perhaps there could be reassortment with another influenza that the person, uh, a, 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 um, a, a, a human influenza that the person being infected with the novel virus may already have, and there could be a reassortment or there could be reassortment in other ways that may lead to a situation where a new flu virus essentially is created and that flu virus could, could spread more easily from person to person. In other words, you wouldn't need an animal anymore, but rather that new flu virus would, would easily spread from person to person. And then the concern then is that it would, um, it would likely not be a uh, a virus that many people have been exposed to before, so its impact into a naive human population would be greater than some of our than we see with our seasonal flus. Um, could I have the next slide, please? And when we talk about influenza surveillance, again, this is zooming out a little bit, not not concentrating solely on avian influenza and it, as it might affect people. But I just thought it would be important to review, and I'm sure it's a review for many, if not all, uh, uh, of the folks participating this evening, that the health department is doing influenza surveillance uh, associated with with the human influenza burden all the time. So influenza, I believe it was Carrie that mentioned this, that influenza in animals, in poultry is reported to the Virginia Department of Agriculture. Well, influenza in people is reported to the health department, is reportable to the health department. And there are hundreds of public health and clinical laboratories in the U.S. and worldwide that participate in, in, in surveillance, specifically in virologic surveillance for influenza. So actually looking for the strains of influenza that are in circulation, this is one of the ways that we can detect a novel influenza virus. So we're always looking and trying to assess in various ways what the, in, in, a, in a standardized way with, with various surveillance systems, what is the burden of influenza in the human population and what strains are circulating out there? So we have, we have our laboratory surveillance. We also have uh, a network, um, a specific surveillance network that focuses on outpatient visits to healthcare providers for respiratory illness. We have a, uh, our national healthcare safety network um, uh, such as the one that, uh, that helps us uh, understand what kind of influenza burden there is in long-term care facilities. Uh, we also have our mortality surveillance data. So in all of these ways, we try to figure out every year and all the time how much flu is in circulation. So what is the general mortality burden? What is the general morbidity version, ver, uh, burden? And what strains of influenza are in circulation, which helps us uh, bringing us back to influenza A and avian influenza as a potentially novel virus, which brings us back to the infrastructure we have to try to detect novel influenza viruses if they are going to occur in people. Maybe the next slide, please. And here are just some of the the uh, the graphics and the 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 um, sort of visual uh, communication products, if you will that are created by and routinely updated by not only the Virginia De Department of Health, but, but the CDC readily available online in case you ever wanna, wanna check them out. And I, uh, uh, I, would encourage you, I would encourage you to do so, so you have an understanding of what influenza viruses are in circulation and how, how we track that. Uh, next slide, please. So I don't think we need to have too much more talk in this space. You've all had a great education, uh, both from John and Carrie, about what avian influenza virus is, where it's found. 
uh, and, and how it makes its way into the environment and potentially has an impact on uh, other, other animals and, and people. Next slide, please. And in this instance, the, 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 what brought us uh, together here tonight was an interest in hearing about where we are with the Eurasian strain of H5N1, which is what's been keeping us all busy uh, the last year and, and a couple of months, and its various impacts on wild birds, domestic poultry impact, and infection in other wildlife species, which has been uh, covered uh, very aptly earlier in the hour. Next slide, please. So now, as I mentioned before, avian influenza viruses usually do not infect people, but, but sometimes they do. And from the public health perspective, really the major concern about avian influenza is that a person might become co-infected with a seasonal flu virus and an avian influenza virus, which could lead to reassortment of the genome or what we call antigenic shift. And that potentially could allow for a successful person-to-person -person transmission of a, of a novel virus. So, um, again, it's not something that we anticipate or that we've seen happen often, this, this reassortment, which then creates a pandemic. But uh, we know that the consequences of that could be high, as we've seen with the 2009 H1N1, and as we have seen before with an, uh, the, the pandemics over the years that uh, I believe John uh, shared with you earlier in the hour. So. Illness in people is not common, but it can happen, and it can have consequences beyond just that one person. And so that's why um, the health department is uh, does flu surveillance throughout the year and has a particular interest, especially when there is a novel influenza virus uh, in circulation that um, is uh, is could potentially. Uh, affect um, could potentially affect people, and especially when the burden of that avian influenza variant is high, as we've seen here um, with this Eurasian H5N1. In general, I would say at the present time, really the risk to the general public's health from this current H5N1 strain is is low. Um, in fact, we've only had. Uh, and I believe Carrie alluded to this before, we have only had one person in the United States, and I think best I know from world statistics, three people total where this particular strain, this Eurasian H5N1 has been detected. And I will say, at least with the case in the United States, there was some question as to whether or not that person was infected or whether that, whether that um, the swab sample may have been a bit contaminated by uh, some, some environmental contamination in that patient's nares. This, per, this person who tested positive was a responder to a, um, a domestic poultry event and was assisting with depopulation and composting and such. But suffice it to say that person did test positive, that person did meet our definition of a case we would need to report, and so it was reported as a case. But I think it helps to illustrate that while the health department is always trying to sort of lean forward, if you will, to understand what's happening with novel influenza viruses, we do not see uh, and have not seen at this point any kind of major uh, impact or much of a, a human health impact associated with this particular strain. Um, now, and if people are going to uh, become infected, typically, as you see on the slide there, when it comes to transmission, most of the time, that's going to be after direct contact with infected birds or contaminated surfaces. Go to the next slide, please. So now, illness in general with avian influenza, human illness can range from mild to severe. So remember that as uh, Carrie and John shared with you earlier, those designations of low path and high path, they are really uh, describing the impact on poultry. So you can't, it, it, it is a bit difficult to uh, apply them this, to, to people. Suffice it to say that illness can range from mild to severe. Um, certainly over the years, there have been reports of, of um, uh, illness that includes uh, conjunctivitis and maybe sort of 
mild flu-like illness, but but uh, we do get some, not often, but some uh, people who experience severe impacts from an avian influenza illness. Um, it's it's it can if you're ill with avian influenza a virus, it can mimic human or seasonal flu or also COVID-19. So we really need to, in, in many instances, if we're going to differentiate, we need to test to differentiate. Can I have the next slide, please? When people uh, have had direct contact with potentially infected animals, uh, we, ask to we ask them to monitor them. We ask them to monitor themselves for illness for 10 days after their last exposure and, and really um, be uh, alert to any kind of symptoms that might include fever or feeling feverish, cough, sore throat, a lot of the kind of uh, uh, symptoms you would experience if you had uh, the regular seasonal flu. Can you have the next slide, please? And, and here's what the health department has been engaged in. Obviously, not only we do, do we um, have our systems to detect novel influenzas in place, which is, which is uh, uh, all the time, but when, specifically when it comes to people who may have had contact with birds with avian influenza, we have a system uh, and we support our sister agencies with monitoring of those folks who have had contact. So when we do have a higher disease burden and, and possibly more biological pressure, if you will, on people who assist with um, the management of birds that either do or are suspected of having high path AI or avian influenza, we want to monitor those people in a, in a formal way and if any uh, of those folks do start experiencing influenza-like illness, even if mild, we like to, uh, we try to prioritize them for testing through our state lab so that we can, um, again, detect any novel influenza early. Now, we, we have uh, tested uh, several responders throughout this time working uh, with, our, with our district staff to do that. Uh, and and no one uh, no one has has tested positive so far. We have not had any detections of human infections with avian influenza throughout this responder monitoring period. So I've been very we've been very fortunate to have some really um, we, we're very fortunate to have very uh, uh, competent and, and strong uh, district staff uh, in our health districts who can help with this and create a really good uh, surveillance structure and be able to help us detect any novel flu that may occur in those being monitored as quickly as possible. Fortunately, we haven't detected any, but, um, but we, uh, we continue to monitor those folks as they are identified to us. And the next slide, please. Here's again a little bit of insight as to how we do our responder monitoring. And again, when I say we, I mean the local health departments and the, the folks at the district level for whom I'm eternally grateful. We, um, we try to uh, determine, uh, you make sure the monitories have a single point of contact for 24 seven coverage, determine where they might most likely seek medical care, uh, discuss the process with them and then communicate with infection preventionists and, and facility staff to discuss PPE and some precautions in case, and, and coordinating sending specimens to our state lab in case someone presents to them having had recent contact with birds that are suspected of having or have been confirmed with avian influenza and are sick themselves. So uh, that's the general high level overview of, of what we do at the health department to uh, detect influenza all year round, and then uh, pay particular attention to those who have assisted with um, an avian influenza event. Uh, next slide, please. Here's just some of our basic prevention messages. Of course, we're always encouraging people to get your flu shot and to decrease the likelihood that you get flu, which will decrease the likelihood of reassortment uh, if you're ever exposed <coughs> to avian influenza. 
And then uh, typically we advise anybody and uh, Carrie mentioned this before about personal protective equipment for folks to use good barrier precautions around around sick birds. The and and the the more I would say that can scale up or down depending on how many birds you're talking about and in what environment. But generally, uh, good barrier precautions, uh, including eye protection and gloves, are 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 what what we would suggest just as a high level <clears throat> kind of comment there. Next slide. I, I know that some folks on the line are, and and you may know uh, folks on the line. If if you don't, you may know people who do keep backyard poultry. So I just I just thought I'd insert these messages in there to try to um, help folks with with any backyard poultry. Send some basic biosecurity messages their way and there's some great information online not only on the virginia department of ag website but also on the usda's website um at specifically their website entitled defend the flock i i hope i have that right carrie certainly put it in the chat if i've got it wrong but there are a lot of great tools for backyard flock owners to try to keep themselves and their uh, their animals safe and next slide please I'd like to thank all those folks. Like I said, we have a great team, multiple districts working on this, uh, really great folks to work with and they do a great job. So I wanna acknowledge them. And then next slide, got some additional info there that I embedded in the slide set in case folks wanted to check that out. Uh, mostly focused on the kind of CD, CDC oriented and public health uh, oriented information, but there is a great, um, uh, sort of a compendium or, or overview document uh, that's put out by the National Association of State Public Health Veterinarians that you may want to uh, review. And that's um, happy to answer any questions, or I guess we can kind of open it up if if folks have any questions. <laughs> 